Shalom and good morning, everyone. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Please be seated. Let us say the collect of purity together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all men. Together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, to give us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Please stand to say the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to His people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, we receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Collect, the second Sunday after Trinity. Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts the most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for your only Son, Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the ministry of words. Uh, the Old Testament reading this morning is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 4 to 11. Verse 4, Then all the leaders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said to him, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Verse 9, then, Now then obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, These are the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. This is the word of the Lord.
This morning reading is uh, taken from the book of uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 13, chapter 5 to chapter 5, verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believe and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus Christ will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transcend, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the ten that is, our earthly home is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand to sing the gradual hymn. The Gospel reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Verse 20, 
Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him, and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he, find, unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whoever blasphemes the altar, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, standing outside, they sent to him and called him. As a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of Christ. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that as we pay attention to your word right now, that you will open our hearts, our minds, our spirit, our will to your word. Remind us that it is everlasting word. Remind us that this is truth from heaven. This is truth that prevails over time. And this is the truth that we need for our life here on earth. Be with us. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen, amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We want to continue with our series. We started this uh, last Sunday, if you remember, and uh, the office came up with this uh, fancy front cover, which I think is very good. Okay? God's story in 66 verses, and today we are going into the second book of the Bible, uh, Exodus, or no, of popularly known as the departure. Okay, some people are wondering why are we doing this. Sounds a little bit Sunday school. Sounds a little bit like basic. But what I found out is that you know, uh, the more we we know the Bible, the more we get it. The more we expose our, ourselves to the work of to the Word of God whatever that may be, Old Testament, New Testament, gospel, poetry, you know, the more we do it, the more we get it. And this is our purpose, to understand what is God's story in the whole Bible so that we can have that overview in our own mind uh, in uh, living out our Christian life and to know some key verses to help us to know what is, what is it that God wants. Of course, these verses are according to one particular resource. Yeah, there are many verses you can pick up from each of the book, but nevertheless, I think for the purpose of uh, having a trail, having a, 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 common, uh, a common understanding, it will be just useful to just follow this scheme. But I want to encourage you also that don't just let the Word of God be your understanding from Sunday. I think you need to also dig into the Word of God for yourself. Okay, let me do a quick review. Last Sunday, uh, we look at Genesis. We look at Abraham. We look at the father of many nations, the father of us all, right? The spiritual grandfather, great grandfather, if you want to use the word. And the first that we, we paid attention to was uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, where it talks about a belief and a faith. 
right? And this faith is in God. Of course, with Jesus Christ, the coming of Jesus Christ in the gospel, we, we, we also uh, go back, you know, the Old Testament doesn't uh, disqualify the New Testament. Know that the, this, the, old, the New Testament disqualifies the Old Testament. But as you consider both, you figure out that actually one leads to the other, the other leads to one also, okay? So it must begin with a faith in God. Uh, but with the advent of Jesus Christ, right, there is this uh, verse that says in the Bible, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we qualify this faith by having a faith in Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean Abraham did not believe in the Son of God. He did. Very much so. He believed in God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? And in how it was manifested to him at that time. But definitely there, there is faith in God, this belief in the Lord that you and I also share. But we must be very clear. It must be through Jesus Christ. It must be very clear. It must be through Jesus Christ. As more revelation is revealed, it must be qualified, okay? And then we also talk that faith is not good enough. Belief is not good enough, but there must be action. And because Abraham obeyed and went to the place that was called out to, it was considered as an inheritance for him. A promise of God that not is just words or thoughts, but also in reality. And now we can see across the world, we have many faith inheritance of this person called Abraham who passed many, many years ago. And yet, his legacy, his inheritance still lives on in us, each one of us. Right? So action is needed. Belief is not good enough. Action is needed. And, and I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, don't just uh, believe for the sake of belief. That's important. It's a good start, but not, uh, not good enough. You must carry on to action, to acting it out. And then, of course, we know that with that, Believe in action, there will be righteousness, a right standing with God, as we see in James chapter 2. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and I like the last part, and he was called God's friend. Wouldn't that be amazing for us to be called God's friend? Not just God's follower, not just God believers, not just Christian, but God's friend. And this is my, my desire for each one of us also as a congregation, as a church, as we look and understand the Bible even more, that we understand what is it that God wants from us so that we can be His friend. So let's go down to the next book now. We want to look at the book of Exodus. Yeah? To, to share a little bit of what is going on, let me, let me give you uh, some pictures. Okay? Uh, it starts, oh, that is a, uh, a, a segmented picture it's uh, Moses in the uh, found by the river, okay? Found by the river, right? By the princess and straight up by the princess. And then he ends by, uh, and then of course we know Moses uh, in where he is, Mount Sinai, the giving of the, the Ten Commandments. And of course that, that whole book of the Bible ends with uh, Moses handing on the mantle of leadership of the people of Israel to uh, this young man called Joshua. Okay? Young men now doesn't mean young men then. They are of different context. Okay? But understand that there is a passing of the mantle, right? From Moses to Joshua. Roughly, when you think about Exodus, you'll find that there is this speaking of through the burning, of, burning bush, an amazing story in itself that a bush caught fire but didn't, wasn't consumed. And they call it the burning bush experience. Right? There was this uh, return to Egypt. And of course, we remember the ten plagues. And we then remember that uh, through the ten plagues and the final one, they were released from uh, Egypt, the land of slavery, to pursue what God has originally called Abraham into the promised land. And of course, all that with the parting of the Red Sea and the Ten Commandments, and then later on, right, Joshua will become the leader, and is the Israelite camp outside of Jericho has entered the Promised Land, and then the beginning of the occupation of the Promised Land. Okay, 
If you are into uh, maps, uh, this is what looks like the journey, the one in red, from your uh, right to your left. Okay, from Goshen, a place of uh, a wonderful place of uh, in Egypt that where the Israelites were uh, assigned to during Joseph's time. Okay, end of Genesis, Joseph's time. Right, they traveled down the Sinai Peninsula, back up. And then they went, they, they even had a wilderness, and eventually they will go to this place, Jericho, where they will enter. So this is what they say the Exodus journey, the wilderness journey, uh, would look like uh, over that period of the book of Exodus. And then, of course, we know that during that time, there is that giving of the Ten Commandments, and there is also the Ten Plagues. Okay? So right now, uh, and then, of course, if you think about the book of Exodus, Right? We have uh, 40 chapters in broad. Right? Uh, they say six scenes. The first one being uh, the Hebrew story, the Moses background, and then number two, uh, Moses leading the people into freedom. This is together with the ten plagues. Right? And then the wandering in the wilderness. Then the law is given. This is where it becomes... Uh, not just the people who came out of Egypt, but now becoming God's people. And what does God expect from His people? Hence the law. And then, of course, there was this drama with the golden calf. Uh, just an amazing, just an interesting story. I wouldn't say amazing, but very weird actually. Because uh, Aaron said that uh, they put in the gold, they burned the gold, and the, the, the calf came out. Right? Sounds very Hollywood actually. You know, the calf came out. Is it for real? Uh, but this is what, what is recorded for us, that because of man, because of our intent, we can make anything out of anything. Right? Just to show how deceitful man's heart can be. And of course, then there is the construction of the tabernacle going forward in the last uh, six chapters of Exodus. Some, somebody gave this picture, which I thought is very uh, poignant. Uh, is there a picture, Rezo? Yeah, okay. From the world, the land of slavery, the exit, and into God's presence, right? In the middle of the book of Exodus. With chapter 19 is where it begins, the God's experience, the exit from the world, right? From the world of slavery into the God's own, uh, a people of God's own possession uh, heading towards the promised land. And, and where we are right now is uh, here. Exodus chapter 19. Okay. So I, I found a video which I think is very uh, interesting for us to watch. Uh, has background to this first 19 chapters of uh, Exodus. A six minute video, but it will give us the perspective of Moses and how we're going to. Can we, can we screen that video? Maybe we can dim the light a little bit. The book of Exodus. It's the second book of the Bible, and it picks up the storyline from the previous book, Genesis, which ended with Abraham's grandson, Jacob, leading his large family of 70 people down to Egypt. Now, Jacob's 11th son, Joseph, had been elevated to second in command over Egypt, and he had saved his whole family in a famine. And so Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, offered the family to come live there as a safe haven. And so eventually Jacob dies there in Egypt, and Joseph and all his brothers do too. About 400 years pass, and the story of the Exodus begins. Now that name refers to the event that takes place in the first half of the book, Israel's Exodus from Egypt. But the book has a second half that takes place at the foot of Mount Sinai. In this video, we'll just focus on the first half, where centuries have passed, and the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied, and they filled the land. Now, this line is a deliberate echo back to the blessing that God gave all humanity back in the Garden of Eden. And it reminds us of the big biblical story so far. Humanity forfeited God's blessing through sin and rebellion, and so God chose Abraham's family as the vehicle through which he would restore his blessing to all the world. But the new Pharaoh does not view Israel as a blessing. He actually thinks this growing Israelite immigrant group is a threat to his power. And so just as in Genesis, humanity rebels against God's blessing, so here Pharaoh attempts to destroy the source of God's blessing, the Israelites. He brutally enslaves them in forced labor, and then he orders that all the Israelite boys be drowned in the Nile River. 
Now, Pharaoh, he is the worst character in the Bible so far. His kingdom epitomizes humanity's rebellion against God. Pharaoh has so redefined good and evil according to his own interests that even the murder of innocent children has become good to him. And so Egypt has become worse than Babylon from the book of Genesis. And so now Israel cries out for help against this new Babylon, and God responds. God first turns Pharaoh's evil upside down as an Israelite mother throws her boy into the Nile River, but in a basket. And so he floats safely right down into Pharaoh's own family. He's named Moses, and he grows up to eventually become the man that God will use to defeat Pharaoh's evil. In the famous story of the burning bush, God appears to Moses and commissions him to go to Pharaoh and order him to release the Israelites. And God says that he knows Pharaoh will resist, and so he will bring his judgment on Egypt in the form of plagues. Then God also says that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. And so we're introduced into the next main part of the story, the confrontation between God and Pharaoh. Now, what does this mean that God says it will harden Pharaoh's heart? It's super important to read this section of the story really closely and in sequence. In Moses and Pharaoh's first encounter, we're told simply that Pharaoh's heart grew hard. There's no implication that God did anything. And so in response, God sends the first set of five plagues, each one confronting Pharaoh and one of his Egyptian gods. And each time, Moses offers a chance for Pharaoh to humble himself and to let the Israelites go. But after each plague, we're told that Pharaoh either hardened his heart or that his heart grew hard. He's doing this of his own will. And so eventually, it's with the second set of five plagues that we begin to hear how God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So the point of the story seems to be this. Even though God knew that Pharaoh would resist his will, God still offered him all of these chances to do the right thing. But eventually, Pharaoh's evil reaches a point of no return. I mean, even his own advisors think that he has lost his mind. And it's at that point that God takes over and bends Pharaoh's evil towards his own redemptive purposes. God lures Pharaoh into his own destruction as he saves his people, which is what happens next. With the final plague, it's the night of Passover, and God turns the tables on Pharaoh. Just as he killed the sons of the Israelites, so God will kill the firstborn in Egypt with a final plague. But unlike Pharaoh, God provides a means of escape through the blood of the Lamb. And here the story stops and introduces us in detail to the annual Israelite ritual of Passover. On the night before Israel left Egypt, they sacrificed a young spotless lamb and painted its blood on the doorframe of their house. And when the divine plague came over Egypt, the houses covered with the blood of the lamb were passed over and the sun spared. And so every year since, the Israelites have reenacted that night to remember and to celebrate God's justice and his mercy. But Pharaoh, because of his pride and rebellion, he loses his own son, and he's compelled to finally let the Israelites go free. And so the Israelite slaves make their exodus from Egypt. But no sooner do they leave that Pharaoh changes his mind, and he gathers his army and chases after the Israelites for a final showdown. As the Israelites pass through the waters of the sea safely, Pharaoh charges towards his own destruction. The Exodus story concludes with the first song of praise in the Bible. It's called the Song of the Sea. And the final line declares that the Lord reigns as king. And then the song retells in poetry what the story of God's kingdom is all about. It's about how God is on a mission to confront evil in his world and to redeem those who are enslaved to evil. God is going to bring his people into the promised land where his divine presence will live among them. This story is what it looks like when God becomes king over his people. So after the Israelites sing their song, the story takes a sharp turn. The Israelites are trekking through the wilderness on their way to Mount Sinai, and they're hungry, they're thirsty, and they start criticizing Moses and God for even rescuing them. They say they long for the good old days in Egypt. I mean, it's crazy. So God graciously provides food and water for Israel in the wilderness, but these stories, they cast a dark shadow. And we begin to wonder, could it be that Israel's heart is just as hard as Pharaoh's? We shall see. But for now, that's the first half of the book of Exodus. Okay. So that's by way of background. Okay, so you know where I'm coming at. Now we are in Exodus chapter 19. 
And that's our attention here, okay? Where the people of Israel, two million, uh, two million of them, uh, that's uh, four times the population of Brunei. Two million of them trek across a wilderness, right? They were already complaining, it's all right. Now they say in the third month, okay? So where is Sinai, Mount Sinai? It's here, roughly there. The bottom of the Sinai Peninsula. And they say Mount Sinai looks like this. Not very impressive. Uh, not, uh, you know, like if, if you were in Sabah, you know, it's Mount Kinabalu. Uh, that stands out, you know, everybody, all Sabahan that I know, including my wife, wants to climb Mount Kinabalu. You know, uh, but I don't know if, if anybody there like want to climb Mount Sinai. But this is what Mount Sinai may look like. Okay? It's about that area in south of the Sinai Peninsula. And here we see the people have arrived. They arrived in the third month. Beginning of the third month, I don't know, but sometime in the third month. Because they, they talk about the third new moon. Okay, so each month is a new moon, so sometime in the third month. And then Moses is asked to go up to the mountain in verse 3 and 4. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptian and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. This refers to the exit from Egypt across the Red Sea. And yet, we saw earlier that there was already complaint within, the, within a few weeks of crossing that Red Sea, seeing the marvellous escape, seeing the marvellous hand of God, they would begin to complain. Okay? But that, that is not the agenda here. God wanted to remind Moses and the people that you have seen a wonderful miracle, miracles upon miracles. Right? And I brought you here. And then the, this is the plan. God reveals his plan for the people. Now, therefore, if you indeed obey my voice, this is verse 5 and 6, and keep my co covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. This is the plan of God for his people. goes back to Genesis, the call for Abraham. Right? You, shall, you shall be a people for all my own possession. It goes back to God's plan. It goes back to Adam, where God has intended for a, a relationship between man, woman, and himself. Right? But because of sin then and sin later, you know, all the things begin to unfold, unfortunately, and, and disrupted that plan. But that plan, we must understand, my brothers and sisters, still remains to this day. God is still looking for his treasured possession. God is still looking for a kingdom of priests. God is still looking for a holy nation. But of course, the proviso is that the obedience is there and the keeping of the covenant of God is there. The rest of the chapter in Exodus is roughly you can do. Moses goes down and shares this plan with the elders and the people agree. He then tells the, the people uh, to be consecrated. Tell Moses to consecrate the people because Mount Sinai would be the place where God will come down, and He does come down. Right? But they cannot go up the mountain. No, they cannot come and see Him because there is that uh, separation of holiness and unholy. So the consecration needs to be done. God then comes down on Mount Sinai and calls Moses up to the summit, and He meets with God, and then later on, God reminds Moses to go down and warn the people again, lest they get excited. You know how it is, right? When you set a border, people do get excited. Some people didn't even pay attention to instruction. They would just go. But this time, bring up Aaron. Remember Aaron, the nephew? Right? This is uh, that set up here, okay? And then, of course, you know, in Exodus chapter 20, God gives the Ten Commandments. The new rules, the new uh, way of living, the new order, of lifestyle that he wants of his treasured possession, his kingdom of priests, and his holy nation. Uh, that's where we get the Ten Commandments up to today. The Ten Commandments give, have given rise to many a legal system in the world. Right? Uh, and, and this is all by and parcel of God's plan also. And it is so good that even 
uh, the secular world, so to speak, has taken it up for themselves. Okay? So this plan, what is this plan? This plan, verses 5 and 6, let me read it again. Therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be a treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, God is very good, right? So, so good. He even gave a two-point uh, condition and a three-part outcome. A two-point condition and a three-part outcome in this plan, right? To, so that to help some of us who, who like this um, in, in enumeration, two plus three. So what is the two condition? We must obey God's voice and keep God's covenant. This is the precursor to the Ten Commandments. Was he referring to the earlier command, uh, covenant that he made with Abraham? Earlier covenant he made with Adam? Yes, also that. But now, I mean, don't forget, at that time, there was no written word. It was only passed on orally and uh, family to family. Okay? But what is very clear is that God wants obedience from us. Right? There are going to be laws. There are going to be these rules. God wants the people to obey these rules and to keep this commandment. In fact, obedience is not just the key, but obedience is necessary in the kingdom of God. My brother and sister, you say that you are a believer. Then show me your obedience to the word of God. Show me. And if you do not know the word of God, then find out the word of God. Find out His voice is written down for us. God has written down the Bible for us to contain all that He has, has said to us. The covenants included. In fact, somebody, somebody would say that uh, God desires obedience from His people. It's one passage and it's one verse in the scripture. God desires obedience more than sacrifice. Sacrifice of what? Time? Sacrifice of resources? Sacrifice of, of animals? No, God doesn't want all. God wants our heart. And that's why we must go back to basic when it comes to God. If you obey my voice and you keep my covenant, then all this outcome will be yours. This is what God wants from us, an obedient people. Covenant is what, how God has, chose us, has chosen to communicate with us. Right? That's the covenant. And to make His promises to us. In fact, our Bible, is some people will call it, not just the Old Testament and the New Testament, not the First Testament and the Second Testament, but the Old and New Covenant. The Latin word for covenant itself is testament. So this is God's voice recorded for us. This is God's covenant recorded for us. And that's why we must, again, understand what God is like. God wants this from us and it's given to us. The problem with us sometimes is because the Bible don't jump into color. The Bible don't get you know, animated and thank God for resources to help us understand. But it's imperative for you and I then to dig the Word of God for ourselves. Psalm 119 verse 11 tells us, In my heart I store up your Word so I might not sin against you. Uh, this weekend, the cool team are having a retreat and yesterday I was with them and I, and I shared with them my, my own uh, experience with scripture memory, memorization, you know? And, and the, the older one all say yes, yes. The younger one don't know what I'm talking about. Because I think we have lost the art of memorizing scripture. I wonder how many of us here have memorized scripture for ourselves. Says, don't worry, this, there, won't, there won't be a test. No, don't worry. The Reverend Martin is not sitting here because he wants to test. No. But I wonder how many of us actually have stored up God's word in our heart. God's understanding, God's word. And that's why part of the reason is this series for us to understand the word of God even better for ourselves. As a church, as a people of God, as God's follower. May we begin to capture a little bit more of what God has intended for us and maybe for that, we will be the better for it. But let me say, if we don't, if we don't have scripture in our heart, then we are losing out. It, uh, one analogy we can use is this. 
You know, like your phone? Your phone has got photos, your phone has got music, your phone has got messages, right? So once in a while, you go back to your phone. And then, ah, yeah, cannot find. There was one time I couldn't find it. So I asked my wife, where is this picture? She said, you don't have it. Ah? No, I don't have it because I lost it. Because I didn't store it. But if I have the picture, I have the music, I have the words, I can recall it. And it's the same for us. If we don't have the storage of the Word of God in our life, we cannot recall it when we need it. And this is a simple analogy. But this is where I, I want to I wanna encourage you. Uh, each time when we do this uh, series, this, the verses, like in this case, verse 5 and uh, 6 of Exodus chapter 9, use that as a memory verse for yourself. So that you can store up God's Word. So that you will be careful not to sin against God. Because you know what He requires of you. John chapter 14 verse 23 tells us that if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Not just do my word, he will keep my word. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. This is the promise of God for us. When we keep his word, when we obey his word, when we do his word. And this is that this is basically what God requires of us. An obedience of our heart, not an obedience just of our mind. Because sometimes we do because we have to. Obedience is we do because we want to. We understand the reason for this. We understand why it's important for us to have God's word in our life. So this is the two of that plan. The two condition that God requires of us. Obedience and a keeping of His Word in our life. Let's look at the... Let's look at, let's look at a little bit more. What, what are we talking about? We're talking about, again, His Word. I mentioned that already. Okay. What are, we, what are we referring to? His voice, His covenant, His Word. Somebody sent, somebody sent this to me. I thought it was... In the beginning, and all that, and then he said, God is speaking in over 900 languages. What is He referring to? The Bible in so many languages. The question is, are we listening? Are we paying attention? I mentioned last Sunday that God has given us two books. One, the Bible. Secondly, creation. If you look at creation, scientists will say this. If you look at creation, you look at the, the natural phenomenon, you cannot but wonder who did it? Who did it? Science is trying to explain what they see, what they know, right? And there are signs that cannot explain how creation is created. How our body, our natural body, will restore itself through rest, through sleep, right? And, and this, again, is God speaking to us. The question is, are we listening? I like this. Huh? I like this phrase. Somebody said this. Uh, Franklin, one of the Franklins, okay, uh, said this. If God said it, He'll do it. The question for us is, we don't know if God said it. And maybe this is why we need to rediscover the Bible for ourselves, understand what God has said, so that He will do, and we can then watch in awe of what He will do, because He has already promised us. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. What a wonderful promise that is. First, He reminds us we are faith, He's faithful. Right? God is faithful, right? Everybody will not disagree with this. God is faithful. Although we may not be so faithful. But yet God promises that He will keep His covenant of love to a thousand generations, to those who love Him and keep His commandment. Let me encourage you to understand more of His commandment, understand of His word for yourself. Psalm uh, 33 tells us, For the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything He does. We trust many things in life, we trust our work, we trust our friends, we trust our colleagues, we trust our family. But what about trusting the Word of God more? 
trusting God more, taking Him at His word. That only happens when we know what He said, when we know what He has given us, when we know that it is already in His plan for us to be like this, to do like this. Let me say a little bit more. Prayer is one way we can learn to listen to God. Right? Richard Foster said this, Prayer is listening to the still, small voice of God. Listening with the ear of our hearts. So let me encourage you, when you pray, don't be so quick to say, that sometimes we treat God like an ATM. The password is in Jesus' name. Yeah, we want this, we want that, we want this, we want that, we want this, we want that. And you know, before God can say anything, you say finish already. Expecting a result. And then when the result don't come, you complain, why God never listened to my prayer? Yeah? And, and unfortunately, it is us. Prayer is two-way. We know this. We learn this. But we don't practice it. Uh, of course, we are in an emergency. The hands we pray. People who need God will pray. But I think we need to listen first. Listening to God is an art. And I think we need, this is also God speaking to our heart. But again, don't forget, he will recall the words in your life, the, His word in your life to remind. You know, I, I remember always uh, Robert Kisbury. When he led prayer meeting, the prayer ministry in our church, he would be bang, 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 Bible verses, right? And for a while, I was wondering why so many Bible verses. But actually, what he's doing is right because he's using the word of God to shape our praying. And that should be the case because it is God's word written for us, God's word given to us. And of course, it makes sense for us to bring that word not to God. God remembers what he said. The problem is we forget. So he brings that word to our memory, our recollection, so that when we pray, we can pray better, we can pray clearer. It's not for our benefit. But God already knows what we need. The question is, do we know what we need? Do we know what we should have? That only happens when we know the Word of God. A little bit more about prayer. Mother Teresa said this, God speaks in the silence of the heart. Listening is the beginning of prayer. So let me encourage you when we pray, let's pause. Let's listen to what God is to say. It also settles us down. Right? And let God interject, God interrupt, God tells us more. You know, at prayer meeting, I, I try not to be the first to pray because I want to hear what God is telling us, what God is speaking. But when we allow God the space and the time, He will speak. He will impress your heart. He will impress your mind. He will impress your spirit on certain words, keywords. And then the spirit will connect, 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 connect. And then you begin to understand what is the plan of God for that situation. This guy, uh, Alfred Brundell, Brundell uh, uh, said this. Very interesting. The word listen contains the same letters as the word silent. Wow. The word listen contains the same letters as the word silent. So let us pause. Let us not be so quick, you know. The world is, you know, we are so busy running around here, there, everywhere, want to redeem time. You know, my, my family knows I'm always running from one to another, trying to redeem time. But you no, know, sometimes we just need to stay still. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. Be still. This is his word. Be still. And in our stillness, we invite God into our situation. Not in our... Praying only, not in our fidgeting, not in our busyness or business. You know? and, and this is where we begin to inculcate a dependence, a wait upon, a waiting upon God that He will speak to us. I think this was uh, said by the late Dallas Willard. God's voice is never condemning, but always filled with love and grace. So when you wait for God's voice, when you wait for that, that silence, that 
when we listen with the ear of our heart, we begin to re be assured of God's love for us. And, and that is so much needed in these days and age of so busy, so busy of doing this, doing that. Now we forget to love. We forget to share grace. We, we forget to show grace. We forget to receive grace. And that's why we need to let God speak. Speak into our life. At the end of this service, uh, at the end of this uh, sermon, I will also want to do that. Just a little bit, let God speak to us and not just be so quick to end. You know, we are so scared of silence when actually God wants us to just be in silence before Him. So what, what else is the plan? Okay, the plan is that there are two preconditions, there are two conditions, the obeying of the voice of God and the keeping of His covenant. And there, there are three, there are, there are, there are three uh, outcomes. Okay, the first is uh, a treasured possession. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 tells us, For you are people holy to, lo to, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of, the all of, out of all the people, peoples on the face of the earth, to be His people, His treasured possession. What comes to your mind when you think about treasure? Yeah? Treasure is also not, I know there is a, a general idea what treasure will look like. But again, treasure is also relative. But what I know about treasure is that it's valuable. Tell a young uh, teenager to throw away their favorite toy. Yeah? I, I recently was, uh, last month I was in Syria and uh, one of our uh, members there, you know, uh, uh, Indian family, his children went back to India and I remember giving him uh, a teddy bear for the daughter because I know the daughter, daughter, the daughter was very young then and then this time now the daughter is back 12 years old and you know what? That teddy bear, this is maybe seven years that teddy bear still came with her. It's very valuable. You know? It's only a, uh, it's only a teddy bear. Right? No, no big deal, but, right? right? No big deal. It probably doesn't cost very much, but it's so precious to her, so valuable to her, that she'll bring it everywhere. Yeah? So I asked her, your teddy bear got a passport or not? Because you went to India and came back with it. Did you got a passport or not? Is it legal or not? You know, I'm just joking with her. But it's valuable, Right? I mean, God considers us valuable. Isn't that wonderful? I'm one of 8 billion people in the world. And God considers me valuable. God considers you valuable. Right? Some of you may have to, may want to, may have, may, may, may need to hear that. Because maybe you feel God has forgotten you. In a mix of many things in life, God, you mean you feel God has forgotten you because you have not had any good outcome, God outcome. But let me say this to you this morning. You are valuable in the eyes of God. He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for you. Not just valuable, you are prized. Wow. A prize. Yeah, people compete for prizes. You know, I always, I always uh, uh, find it very strange that when we do children ministry, children camp, Whatever, uh, they must always be priced. Number one, number two, number three. But actually, it's all plastic, right? Very cheap plastic at that, but they like the price. They like the price, you know? And, and this is what God said, you are priced. I had to fight for you. I had to fight for you. And isn't that wonderful that like God will fight for me? God will compete for me to make me His price? I'm special. I think the special gone already. I'm special. Let's go find the special. Uh, I'm special. That's peculiar. You know, another version of the Bible says, uh, the New Living Translation says peculiar. Not just a treasured possession, but a peculiar possession. Peculiar is not weird, uh, by the way. Don't think it's weird. Don't think it's weird. Uh, but it's, God considers us valuable. May we realize this. People may not consider us valuable. People may not think very much of us. Our friends, 
our family. But God says, you are treasured, you are valuable, you are prized, you are peculiar for Him. The second thing that we learn is that He, he says, we shall be a kingdom of priests. Here, we turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And when you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people acquired for a possession so that you may tell out the virtues of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvellous light. What does that tell us? It tells us that we have a role to play. Yes, God has chosen us. God has made us a priest unto Him, holy unto Him, uh, acquired us for what purpose? To tell of this virtue Virtues of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. There is a work for us to do. Not just a wonderful position, wonderful space, a place for us, but a role for us to play in this plan. As priests, one of the things that priests do is we mediate. Right? In the old traditional sense, we mediate between God and man. We are the mediator. We are the reconciler. Right? We always seek to reconcile man with God. Sinful man, sinful saved by grace, man and woman, reconcile to God. And then we also, also in, in the business of sanctification, that's a big word. What sanctification means? Holy living. Living according to the word. Living according to the standard that God has placed before us. But let's not forget, as priests, we are servants of God. Nobody likes to be called a servant. Right? Nobody likes to be called a servant. Just imagine you call Joshua, you servant. You, don't, you wouldn't like it. Why did, why did uh, Bishop Andy call me a servant today? But you're a servant of God. You and I are servants of God. As priests before God. means that there is a role we must do. There is a task that we must perform. There is a function for us as His chosen race, His royal priest, His holy nation. But of course, we know with Jesus, we have the priesthood of all believers. That, that curtain that separated the holy of holies from the holy place is torn down at the resurrection of Jesus, at the death of Jesus. It's torn down so that all can access to the Father. But if we can access to the Father, it means there is work for all of us to do also. Not the benefit only. We like the benefit. Who doesn't like benefit? But the benefit, but understand that God requires us to respond, to take that responsibility, to work out the responsibility for Him. That's as a kingdom of priests. It's a role that you and I must play. And thirdly, a holy nation. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 9. The Lord will establish you as a whole, His holy people. As He promised you on oath, if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in His ways. A holy people. What does that mean? Holiness basically means set apart. Separated. In the world, yes, but not of the world. But here we must qualify it. Set apart for God. Just like the things of the altar. Just like when somebody dedicates themselves for ministry work. It is for God's work. It is for God's work. Just like this building, we're not going to have any uh, parties in here. You know, not like, and unfortunately in the UK, uh, my, my heart was broken when I heard about a cathedral having a rave party. In a cathedral. Supposedly to draw younger people into the church. No, I have a better solution. Preach the word of God. Preach the word of God. Because the people out there want the word of God. We don't need to go on the gimmicks. We're not here to entertain. We're not here to just keep you alert or in, in, in uh, illuminator or whatever. We're here to inspire the word of God in your life. To set you apart for God in your life, in your workspace, in your home, in your family space in how you conduct your life. That's what it means to be a holy people to God. Understand that we are people for His own possession. 
meaning that He owns us, He's bought us. We are His. We don't belong to ourselves. Unfortunately, many uh, believers, many uh, Christians think that they own themselves. They do their own thing without consultation with God, without consulting with the Word. We do it because this is how we do it. Is that true? Is that how we're supposed to do it? Yesterday, I was again I was at a cool, re, uh, the cool retreat. I was telling them, do we, we run children ministry as we've been doing? You know, uh, Anglicans got this phrase, uh, and you will know this. Uh, as he was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. And all Anglicans say, Amen. Is it? Is it? Is that what it should be? Right? Mean that we already know what we need to do? Huh? God is a creative God. Just look at creation. God wants us for Himself to live a life that honors Him, a live a life that will tribute Him, a live a life that will glorify Him. Then the question we need to ask ourselves is, what does it mean? What does it mean a people for his own possession? Meaning that we belong to him. We don't belong to the world. We don't even belong to ourselves. We belong to him. May we separate ourselves. May we set apart ourselves for his will. I'm not talking that you suddenly become a ministry worker. No. But in your work, what standard are you using? The Bible or the world? I don't even use the word Christian, you know. Because I've, I've, I've seen many, many ways we, we use the word Christian so much that it doesn't actually mean anything in the Bible. Why do I say that? I, I, I have some friends of mine, they, use, they, use, they, they, they don't use the word Christian counseling, they use biblical counseling. Meaning they start with the word of God. Because sometimes Christians, we, we take on practices that we are so used to, we call it Christian because we are using it. Maybe because we have lost the plot. And that's why we need to go back to the Bible. Understand what God wants. Be what God wants. Do what God wants. Live a life according to how He wants it. And you cannot go wrong if you go back to the Word of God. You cannot go wrong when you go back to His voice. You cannot go wrong to His words. You cannot go wrong to His covenant that is given to us. And that's why it's given to us. The Bible is given to the people of God. For what purpose? To instruct us on the ways of God. Let me encourage you in our series. Start reading the Word of God for yourself. Start reading. The more you read it, the more you get it. The more you read it, the more you understand it. The more you, you read it, the more God has of you. So let me summarize. Exodus chapter 19, very clear. Two conditions, three outcome. This is what God requires of us. The obedience of His Word and the keeping of His covenant. And what we are basically talking about is His Word. May we be people who obey and keep His Word in our life so that we can say, I belong to God. Don't tell me you're a Christian if the Word of God don't, is not in your heart. Not kept in your heart. I'm not talking about Sunday school stories. I'm talking about active understanding of the Word of God. That means you need to work at it. Work at it. A, pri a treasured possession. I'm a treasured possession according to God. Right? But let me obey the Word of God. Let me keep the Word of God. I am a servant of God. A kingdom of priests. But that only works when I obey God's word. Keep his commandment. And I'm wanting to set myself apart for him. Only works when I obey his voice and keep his commandment. Let's, let, let, let's practice a little bit of silence now. Uh, we won't show the second video. Okay, there's a second part. Uh, you can look it up in, the, in Google. I got it from Google anyway. Uncle Google is very helpful these days. But let, let, let's be quiet. Let's, where we are, close our eyes. I'm not asking for an altar call. I'm not asking for a response. Yes, I am. I am, but I want you to respond where you are. Let's just 
listen to God. Psalm 46 verse 10 reminds us, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Father, we submit ourselves to your word. We submit ourselves to your word, we submit ourselves to your word. Help us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you to Bishop Andy. Please stand. We shall say the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom at no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead. Life of the world come. Amen. Please be seated, brother and officers. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. Um, especially that I just walked with one auntie. I'm so sorry I didn't get your name. Uh. Where are you with your grand manadia? No, I'm trying to focus here. Ah, yes, there you go. Hi, auntie. It's been uh, because she's not uh, been in church for so long because she's not well. And that's the handsome, big, strong, tall is his, her, her grandson. Well done. <laughs> wow. I was, that really made my day. <laughs> okay, let's get back, let's focus. Again, everyone, welcome. So, on to our notices. Uh, this coming Tuesday, there will be a prayer meeting. And it's so encouraging to see, uh, especially from those from uh, English, EU, uh, English One service. It's very encouraging to others, especially. And last week, we had the PCC members. Wow. I mean, this month is... Really awesome. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm so excited about it because every day, every week, every month, there's something new from God. So 
we are always looking for something new from God. Amen? So please come and join us. Uh, usually, just to, keep, to give you a little bit of idea, maybe you, um, maybe you are wondering how do we do the prayer meetings. We always start with praying with each other because there's, there may be a need. So we, we, come up in, we, become, uh, we come into small groups so we can share maybe private or something like that. And then we pray for, for each one another. So please do come with us. Join us uh, this coming uh, uh, Tuesday, only for one hour. Next, Gawai Ngiling Bidai ataupun Ngiling Tikai. This is a, a closing of the Gawai Festival. Uh, maybe if you're wondering uh, how it's going to be look like, uh, there will be traditional food, uh, maybe yeah, something like that. Uh, it will be organized by the Gigsa, the, the Iban uh, community in our uh, Iban, ser Iban service. And if you're also wondering, will there be any rice wine? I'm not so sure. This is a closing of the festival. We're not starting something new. So maybe we will we'll hold on to that. So the entry ticket will be $10. Uh, it'll be on the 16th of June. Um, it will be at 6, oh, sorry, on the 22nd of June. That's uh, on Saturday at 6.30 at the St. Andrew's School Hall. Not here, School Hall. Okay? That will be on the 22nd of June. Next one. Uh, the church office will be closed on the 28th of June. That is uh, on Friday for the uh, Archdeaconry of Brunei staff and readers retreat. But if there is any uh, an emergency or an urgent that you want to uh, call the office, please call this number. Yeah? Uh, I think avoid texting. I think it's best to call. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, maybe this is a landline, is it? Yeah, it's a landline. So WhatsApp doesn't work. <laughs> okay. okay, next. There will be a worship outreach uh, mainly for the uh, young adults and youths. Uh, tickets will be available next week, $2 per ticket. So if uh, maybe you would like to come in and have a look or you have uh, uh, young people in, in, your, in your family, please do encourage them to join. Yeah? So further note details will be, you can call Becky or Kathy. The numbers are on screen. And this will be on the 29th of June. Also on a Saturday at 7.30. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, coming up. So if you have your phones ready, you can just take a snapshot on this. The Pastors Fellowship Prayer Service, which will be held here in, in, in uh, St. Andrew's uh, Church uh, Hall on the 12th of July. So it, it's an inter-church uh, event. So please do come and join us. Next, we have the baptism, which is on the 15th of July. I know this is a holiday for all, but there will be a baptism uh, on that particular day. Do we still open for, for baptism? Yes. If you need to register to, to have a baptism, either your children, or, uh, so please do come and visit the office regarding that. Next, on the 19th of July, this, coming fr uh, this Friday, I mean next month Friday, Boys Brigade Anniversary. So uh, this is uh, quite new to me. So yeah. anyway, Boys Brigade anniversary. Uh, I have no details yet, but probably in the next uh, next week. So okay, I think that's all. All right. Thank you so much. God bless you. Yes, uh, the intercessor, please. morning church let us pray let us pray for the church and the world let us thank God for his goodness almighty God our heavenly father your promise through your son Jesus Christ to hear us when we pray in faith straighten our bishop Donald Jute bishop Indichi, reverend Martin Dennis pastors readers and all your church in the service of Christ. 
Let those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Give wisdom to all in authority, to His Majesty the Sultan and his cabinet minister, and direct this and every nation in the way of justice and of peace. The men may honor one another and seek the common good to be obedient and follow the word of God in our everyday life. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and to all our neighbors that we may serve Christ in our uh, and one another, and love as he loved us. Comfort those and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Hear us, we remember those who have died in the faith of Christ. According to your promise, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Rejoice in the fellowship of St. Andrew's Church and St. Margaret Church and St. James Church and all your saints. We command ourselves and all Christian people to be your faith, your unfailing love, merciful Father. We accept this prayer to the your Son, our, our Savior, Savior Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. We continue with the prayer of humble access. Let us say it together. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands are unclean, our hearts are unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation. Share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him. That we, with the whole company of Christ, may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. We rise for the peace. <coughs> My brothers and sisters, we are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Also Let's offer one another a sign of peace. We remain standing to sing the offer three hymn.
say together, Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, splendor, and majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, of your own that we give you. The second Eucharistic prayer. My brothers and sisters, the Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Yes, it is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. For He is your living Word. Through Him, you have created all things from the beginning and form us in your own image. Through Him, you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving Him to be born as man and to die upon the cross. You raised Him from the dead and exalted Him to your right hand on high. Through him, you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please sit. Hear us, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Lord. Through him, accept our sacrifice of praise and grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, this gift of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us declare the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, having in remembrance his death once for all upon the cross, his resurrection from the dead and his ascension into heaven and looking for the coming of his kingdom we make with this bread and this cup the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Accept through him this, this offering of our duty and service and as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, fill us with your grace and heavenly blessing, nourish us with the body and blood of your Son, that we may grow into his likeness and make one by your spirit become a living temple to your glory. Together, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom, with, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our honor and glory be yours, almighty Father, from all who stand before you in earth and heaven, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Jesus taught us, so we pray. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours Now and forever Amen We break this bread to share in the body of Christ Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. 
Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. My brothers and sisters, draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you and his blood was shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
the post communion collect, let us say it together. Loving Father, we thank you for feeding us at the supper of your Son. Sustain us with your Spirit that we may serve you here on earth until our joy is complete in heaven and we share in the eternal banquet with Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in the sun and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you set before us so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We say the thanksgiving together, Almighty God, feeding us with the body and blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. To Him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Let me invite you all to stand for the blessing from the Lord through our choir. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, our King, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, 
guide you in truth and peace and the blessing of the Lord God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Now go in peace, love and serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day, O oh Lord. Another day in our life, Lord. Thank you for all your blessings, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. And bring us together, Lord, in your bosom, O oh Lord. Do not forsake us, O oh Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we pray also for the whole day, uh, all the services that is happening uh, today, uh, tonight, 
Uh, Lord, Father, you continue to bless them also, Lord. Bless us all also, Lord. Thank you, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.